thanks everybody for coming and uh, I'd like to first thank the organizers for putting together this excellent workshop. Um, today I'm going to talk about work with my student Kai Chi on um, a slightly different kind of theory to the, to the uh, deep neural networks and, and this is also our first work uh, in this domain so I believe this is really the right audience um, for us to get feedbacks on this line of work uh, so I'm looking forward to, to your questions. Um, so, the talk is going to be about um, how deep neural network works for non-parametric regression, in some sense curve fitting, the simplest problem of, of all, um, and to, to inspect how deep neural network would have performed on this simple task compared to, say, classical methods. And, and surprisingly, we get a lot of interesting insight by investigating these uh, simple-ish problems, uh, and it recovers a lot of... Uh, new things that appears to be not captured by uh, existing models, for instance, neural tangent kernels. All right, so let's, let's get it started. Um, I'm going to um, start with the motivation and, and talk about the scientific questions we're trying to ask and, and to probe it through the non-parametric regression angle. And I'm going to uh, give a, uh, some discussion on the two-layer neural networks, on how things work and uh, what we can do with just two layers before I move on to the more general setting with, with the multiple-layer neural networks. Um, and if I have a time, I'll, I'll also explain the interesting aspect of the proof uh, towards the end of my talk. Okay, so um, machine learning, um, in particular deep learning, has revolutionized a lot of uh, um, the way uh, people do things nowadays, and it's touched upon every corner of our daily lives. Um, and and uh, the workhorse behind a lot of this progress is... Uh, deep neural networks is um, a stacked uh, sequence of computation with uh, linear layers and nonlinearities and, and then repeats for, say, um, L times. Uh, it is quite, a bit, uh, quite surprising that, that such sequence of computation is able to um, just somehow magically give you a state of the art in a lot of interesting uh, application domain comparing to classical methods. Um, I'm just showing the, the most standard feed-forward neural network with ReLU activation. Um, there are many other uh, model architectures, but this is kind of the network that we're going to focus on for this talk. Um, from a statistical point of view, the success of this neural network is um, a bit of a mystery. Um, we've already seen from several previous talks that, that about this double descent uh, curve. And, and in some sense, we're trying to fit uh, more parameters and we have data to fit them in the classical statistical regime. Um, and, and it doesn't really follow the classical bias and variance trade-off and so we need in some sense a new way of measuring the complexity. Um, another interesting and surprising aspect of a deep neural network is although they are like highly non-convex optimization problems and, and sometimes the, the simplest optimization algorithm like stochastic gradient descent uh, just works out of the box. So a lot of people have already worked on this, so I'm not gonna, gonna talk about this, but instead, I'm gonna ask the question in a slightly uh, different way. So I'm gonna ask, like, why do neural networks work better comparing to, say, maybe classical methods? For, for example, like many people have tried to address these questions with, say, approximation theory and generalization theory. Um, so there's this famous universal functional approximation theorem says that we can use neural network, uh, even just a two-layer one, to approximate any um, Lipschitz functions, um, but, but so are like other approaches like kernels and splines, um, the more classical stuff. Um, people sometimes also argue that uh, maybe deep neural network is just a powerful set of uh, um, language, programming language for us to specify things that we will otherwise um, not easily um, describe um, by in incorporating like our induction biases or our prior about problems. But, but so are other things, so are probabilistic graphical models and probabilistic programs that are arguably more transparent than, than in encoding this information using, using a model architecture. And more recently, there's a very interesting line of work that, that explains um, the over-parameterization, um, say, neural tangent kernel and um, benign overfitting, um, say, from talks, uh, the, the previous two, two, two talks. Um, but a, a lot of these things are not specific to neural networks. So, so you, you, you see the same be behavior in linear models when you over-parameterize them. Um, and, and arguably, they are also not um, just directly separating um, like DNNs 
uh, with, with classical models. So in this talk, I'm going to hopefully offer an alternative explanation and to answer uh, specifically why do neural networks work better um, in, in some sense. And, and, and the gist, um, the, the underlying you, you know, uh, philosophy behind this line of research uh, is an adaptivity conjecture. So, so perhaps neural networks, they are, they are not um, really stronger in the information theoretic sense compared to classical methods on many of these problems that we care about, for instance, curve fitting, because we already know that um, for these problems, the classical methods, they are already behaving in some sense optimally, and no other method is able to beat, for instance, wavelet smoothing by, by a constant factor. Um, so, so in some sense, we can't hope neural networks to magically beat the information theoretic limit. But there, there, there are other things that uh, perhaps is the real reason why neural network is a method, uh, the family of methods that people uh, tend to use in practice. Um, for example, it could be the case that the deep neural networks, they are able to be more adaptive. Um, so, so it simplifies the process of selecting models. So we don't need to really specify what function classes that we're we are, uh, trying to fit. Um, we also don't need to, to tune problem-specific hyperparameter by rather tuning only, say, the standard hyperparameters like learning rate and, and weight decay parameters, and that will already give us uh, the adaptively optimal results uh, for these classical family of problems. Yeah, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the punchline that we're hoping to get. Um, Although we are, we're focusing on a very small um, family of problems uh, in this initial work. So, so we'll focus on the classical problem called non-parametric regression, right? So, yeah. So, so suppose um, the data is coming from some signal plus noise, and we assume that the underlying function is coming from um, some smooth family that we do not make much assumptions about this, except that it is, say, twice differentiable. Um, and, and then we observe this function plus noise, and we assume the noise to be independent uh, IID sub-Gaussian. So this is a problem that has been studied for many, many years, um, more than 60 years of research, and uh, there are a lot of classical work on this in, uh, with methods like kernels and splines and local polynomials and so on. Many of these methods are behaving nearly optimally for, for different function classes. Okay, so, so we... Many of you are coming from uh, other communities like uh, signal processing and statistics. They, are, they go with different names, not necessarily non-parametric regression, but also maybe smoothing and denoising and, and filtering. And, and there's also a control angle to this. You can think about this as controlling, um, uh, like filtering a signal with a, with a feedback loop uh, type of control. Um, we specifically want to consider a uh, smaller family of non-parametric regression methods called locally adaptive non-parametric regression, where this underlying function behave um, like, uh, with, with a heterogeneous level of smoothness across the different spatial regions. So, so I'm given uh, three examples. Um, so on the, on the left, uh, we're looking at a Doppler-like signal with high frequency signal on the left, and then it becomes smoother and smoother towards the right-hand side. And in the middle, I'm giving a piecewise uh, linear function. So at the knots, uh, the function is changing more, uh, more quickly, but, but in between, it is very smooth. Right? So this kind of function is smoother in some regions and weakly in other regions are called uh, locally uh, adaptive non-parametric regression problems. And, and in some sense, harder than the, than the uh, cases when the functions are, are, are homogeneously smooth. And on the right-hand side, I'm giving an example in the 2D case with an image. So clearly, the, 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 the sky in the background and the jacket, they are um, pretty much smooth. But at the boundary of this, this cameraman, um, be, between the foreground and background, there are sharp edges that are, um, in some sense, making the problem harder and not captured well with non-parametric regression problems with, with homogeneous smoothness. Okay, so um, one interesting aspect about this family of problems is that the neuron tension kernels are strictly suboptimal for this family. So consider this, this setting where we have this function uh, with a uh, IID noise, and we, we, can, we can capture uh, the idea of uh, heterogeneous smoothness through defining function classes that are in some sense larger. Um, so, so a prototypical example of this is so-called the total variation class. 
Um, so in the total variation class of, say, the, the m's derivative of this function being smaller than c, and the family of all functions, we call this the total variation class. And it is known that the optimal methods for estimating functions like, uh, like this, in this family, using um, noisy observations, achieve this rate uh, in terms of this mean square error. So what we also know is that uh, all the uh, kernel rich regression um, and, and other, say, um, including the neural tangent kernel, um, cannot be optimal for this family of problems. So, so, so there's a lower bound that says that uh, um, any kernel methods, and uh, more generally, any family of uh, any methods that falls into the family of so-called linear smoothers, can only achieve the mean square error that uh, that goes to zero at a much slower rate comparing to the optimal rate. Right? To convince you that this is actually the case, let's take m to be one. Right? So these captures the family of piecewise linear functions, and the optimal um, estimator would give you n to the minus two, uh, four fifths, um, but all the linear smoothers is only three, uh, uh, n to the minus three quarters. Okay, so th with large n, there could be orders of magnitude difference between uh, these, these uh, family of approaches. So the key underlying question that we ask is that uh, are deep neural networks, uh, like how, how do deep neural networks work on these family of problems? Can, can these methods be, be locally adaptive, meaning that can they achieve the optimal rates? Um, do they behave like these more locally adaptive approaches, um, say wavelets, uh, comparing to, say, NTK, right? If it is a ladder, then NTK is really describing the properties of neural networks correctly. Um, if not, so maybe it's not really capturing um, like how neural network is doing better uh, comparing to kernel methods. Okay, so we're also gonna, gonna consider even harder family of problems, like uh, um, the problems with, uh, with even more heterogeneous smoothness. So say we have a composition of a different type of functions. Uh, say over here it is piecewise linear, but over here this is piecewise smooth. And over here it is a, 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 a smooth function, but with changing frequency, right? So, so hopefully deep neural network is gonna do well on this family of functions. And, which, which fails even uh, many of the optimal approaches in the classical non-parametric regression world. Okay. Um, so we're not the first to, to study these problems. So uh, um, uh, a lot, uh, in, the, in the past couple of years, many uh, other researchers have worked on this. So here are uh, a list of papers that have uh, uh, considered this problem of non-parametric regression with uh, neural networks. So, so specifically, uh, Taiji Suzuki uh, has shown that one can achieve the optimal rate uh, for estimating total variation class using a deep ReLU activated neural networks. Um, but the, the, the thing is that uh, they need to, to choose a specific uh, neural network with a particular design, and in particular, the, the number of the parameters needs to have a, a carefully chosen sparsity constraints, which is like, hard to use in practice. Um, there's generalization to this, to, to the convolutional network with a, with a ResNet con connection that doesn't require sparsity, but it still requires a number of parameters to be carefully tuned, right? So it happens in the classical, um, like non over parameterized regime. Um, more recently, the Pahi and Nowark showed that one can achieve uh, this optimal rate with just a two layer neural network. Um, and, and, and in addition, like such two layer neural network with a carefully designed activation function and sufficiently over parameterized is equivalent to a classical method called locally adaptive regression spline. So I'll, I'll talk about this just momentarily uh, in the two-layer case. Okay, so um, um, fast forward to kind of the conclusion that I have. So, so we show that um, a parallel version of um, a deep neural network is only ReLU activation, and um, by tuning only one parameter, tuning only the weight decay, achieves a nearly optimal uh, locally adaptive rate for, um, a fam for, for, for many, many different non-parametric families without knowing what family or problems that we're dealing with. And, and really, we don't have to do any architecture search and tune. Uh, we only need to tune the, the weight decay parameter. And, and the analysis also reveals that uh, the depth is important. And implicitly, doing weight decay is inducing sparsity, and the sparsity is not in the parameter space, but is rather in the 
in the function space um, in terms of how many basis functions that we use um, to, to um, approximate the, the underlying function. Okay, so, so let's jump right into the two layer case as a, as a warm up um, and, and during which I'm also going to introduce some of the tools that we're going to use to analyze a more general case. All right, so, so um, for this crowd, I don't need to introduce uh, what ReLU, uh, uh, ReLU activation is. It's, it's basically just uh, uh, hinge-like um, functions at zero, and everything that's positive remains, uh, remains linear, and everything's negative got clipped to one. Um, by, by way decay, uh, what, what I actually refer to is an is a L2, standard L2 regularization. It's called way decay because in the gradient descent algorithm, there's this implementation that uh, uh, effectively decays the weights uh, after every iteration. Okay, um, so I'm gonna use weight decay to refer to the L2 regularization with this particular uh, carefully chosen parameter uh, lambda interchangeably like for the remainder of the talk. Right? So whenever I say weight decay, it means L square L2 regularization. Okay. Um, so this might be a slide that, that requires a little bit of effort. Um, splines, um, so, so computer scientists don't typically talk about uh, splines, um, but splines are just piecewise polynomials uh, with uh, additional smoothness parameters at the transition point from one piece of the polynomial to the next. Uh, so uh, there are orders of the splines. So linear splines are piecewise linear functions and quadratic splines are piecewise quadratic functions uh, joined together at the different knots. Um, and, and one can use splines to design um, curve fitting tools or non-parametric regression tools. And, and the key concept here is that we need to choose where the knots are and then to figure out uh, um, how much weight that we should assign and what's the parameters of each uh, uh, polynomial function that are connecting the different knots. Okay, so two classical methods, one called the smoothing splines, and the most popular happens to be the cubic smoothing splines. They choose all n of the data points and, and to, be, to be the knots, and then use the regularization to penalize the, um, um, the, the square L2 penalty of the coefficients on the particular uh, um, function basis. And, and the locally adaptive regression splines um, also um, preset all the n data points to be where the knots are, and and then but, but then it uses a one penalty to try to try to select a small number of of knots that are in some sense active, right? Um, so we'll see how how deep net, deep neural network is connecting um, to uh, splines. Another thing about splines that I want to introduce is um, um, a particular set of basis function called truncated power basis. So I'm showing two set of basis functions. So on, on the left, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so first of all, suppose we, we have knots at T1 to Tm, where capital M is the number of knots that we choose ahead of time. Um, um, and one particular set of basis function that spans the entire family of M's order splines is uh, any polynomial basis function. So in this case, this, these are just a monomial basis. And, and then uh, at every knot, I'm using this, uh, um, trun so-called truncated power functions. So two examples are given below. So when m is equal to one, these are just ReLU uh, shifted uh, towards the right, right uh, with knots at the particular knots that you choose, uh, T1 to Tm. And, and when m is equal to three, uh, you get something similar, but then um, the curves, um, like it's, it's like a half polynomial that, that curves up, right? So it turns out that this, um, like a linear combination of this spans the entire family of M solder splines. Um, and and, and why, why, why do we need this? Um, so a key observation from Pahi and Noir is a two-layer neural network is actually um, just exactly so-called free knot splines. So they are um, not, not approximating, so I emphasize, they are not approximating splines, they are exactly splines. With ReLU, they, they are exactly linear splines, um, but suppose you use uh, raises to the power of M, then you can recover um, um, M solder spline with just a two-layer neural network, okay? Um, so, so what's uh, slightly more interesting is that you can extract the scale and sign of this uh, um, weight WJ by merging that with this parameter uh, in the second layer uh, that takes a linear combination of these basis functions and, and calls that CJ, 
right? Um, some manip manipulation is needed to handle the sign, but you can always reparameterize reprim any two-layer neural network, such activation functions, uh, using um, just the, uh, a set of uh, um, um, like truncated power basis function, its linear combination, and the uh, and the polynomial function in the end. Okay, um, so so this says that neural network is really um, just fitting splines, and uh, with the only difference being that it is also learning where the knots are, right? So it tries to adaptively choose where the knots are rather than like the classical approaches of fixing the knots ahead of time. And, and the free knot splines is also a classical method that has been used for, 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 for decades. Okay. Um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is the effect of weight decay. Um, so it turns out that weight decay is equivalent to something called a total variation regularization on the m's derivative of the function. Um, so uh, so here, here's how, how, how it works. So, so first of all, the neural network can be reparameterized re by uh, this representation, and, and now suppose we do weight decay. Um, so this is a modified version of the weight decay, but when m is equal to one, this is a standard weight decay. Um, so what, what we can see is that uh, if we um, if we just 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 do this and apply uh, the the AMGM inequality, uh, and and we can uh, we we can we can write this to be. Uh, the summation to be a product. Um, we, we can lower bound the algebraic mean with a with a geometric mean, and and at the end of the day, with this reparameterization, this term happens to be uh, just absolute value of the coefficients that you use uh, to to apply to this uh, truncated power basis. And and because of that, um, um, and and with the property of the truncated power basis, it's. Uh, all these coefficients, the, the, the sum of the absolute value of these coefficients happens to be the total variation of the m's outer derivative of this function. So with, 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 so with this connection, we're almost getting to uh, the, 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 the first set of results. So as, as the optimal solution, if we only care about the arc mean, then it is equivalent to uh, a regularization term that regularizes uh, this particular functional called total variation. Okay? So... We didn't like propose this, and this is a, in some sense a folklore result has has been used by many authors trying to study neural networks. And and like to my knowledge, it traces back to the Bureau and Montero paper uh, that that connects the matrix factorization and this Frobenius norm regularization to to nuclear norm minimization, um, and 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 it's really exactly the same. It's a special case of of that. But more recently, uh, Ryan Tiffany has written uh, like a nice notes about uh, how to analyze this and use it to show uh, the connection between um, s s lasso and, and, and neural networks. Okay. Um, in addition to the connection between weight decay and the total variation regularization, um, there's a representer theorem that Pahi and Noark has, uh, has proven that says that whenever uh, this is sufficiently overparameterized, when the number of uh, uh, the, when the width of the network is larger than something that's roughly n, the number of data points, and this m is really just a small constant, so you can just ignore that. Whenever this is larger, uh, then, then the solution to this just mildly overparameterized neural network is two-layer neural network is equivalent to this, this solution to this variational problem, which searches over all functions that minimizes empirical risk uh, together with uh, total variation regularization. Okay, and, and, and the right-hand side is known as the locally adaptive regression splines. And from Memon and Vandergeer, uh, it has been shown that this is a method that achieves the optimal rate for, uh, for the total variation family. So, um, two-layer neural network is already answering our questions uh, affirmatively that it is locally adaptive. But what we show is that the equivalence also uh, happens uh, in practice. Um, so so in, in this example, I'm showing um, like two uh, set of results. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the top, I'm showing the weight decay, the ReLU activated neural network uh, by tuning just the weight decay parameter. Right on the bottom, I'm showing the L1 trend filtering, uh, which is a, a, a efficient implementation of the locally adaptive regression spline. 
uh, that work with discrete splines. Um, but yeah, that's a subtlety. Um, but what we can, uh, uh, and, and, and on the left hand side, I'm, I'm showing the, the actually fitted functions with the noisy observations being the red dot. So as we increase either the weight decay or the L1 regularization, we see that uh, uh, it goes from perfectly interpolating the data to, to something that's completely flat and to something that's, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's basically uh, a, a much simpler uh, piecewise linear, linear function that doesn't capture anything at all. Uh, and what's interesting is what I'm showing on the right-hand side. So these figures are known as the regularization path, right? So, so, so uh, when the, the regularization weights that go from, from small to big, um, and, and this measures the changes in the coefficients. Um, and, and, and you can see that a lot of things are non-zero initially, but as you increase the regularization weights, um, or increasing weight decay, and most of the uh, coordinates of those basis functions become zero, right? So, so this illustrates that two-layer neural network is really equivalent to uh, locally adaptive regression spline in practice, and, and, and the optimization for this is not posting uh, significant challenges except in the, uh, in the interpolation regime, okay? And, and um, this, um, in, in some sense, like, is, is providing a slightly different uh, um, uh, explanation to to what what Ma Madi talked about uh, yesterday about uh, the the simple t total variation uh, denoising uh, example with uh, small initialization, right? So if you initialize at zero, so in some sense the early stopping stochastic gradient descent is is penalizing uh, the square L2 norm. Uh, it's doing weight decay if you early stop, um, and and if you stop at the right time, then it is. Like in, in some sense equivalent to uh, doing the right thing, uh, doing the optimal approach of locally adaptive regression spline with the, uh, with, with, with the optimal choice of the hyperparameter. Okay? So, um, so, so far we talk about the two-layer neural networks and, and it gives us a positive answer to the question that we're trying to address, but it's still kind of unsatisfactory. Why? Um, f first of all, um, like this set of results uh, beyond uh, m equals to one uh, with a smoother set of function classes, it, it, like, it requires a non-typical choice of uh, the activation function. So instead of using just ReLU, it needs to use a truncated power basis, uh, truncated power uh, activation function. And also it's like not very satisfactory because it's not doing, like almost not doing representation learning at all. Right? Except for learning where it's in NOS are, and when we pr uh, over parameterize, it is like equivalent to just choosing the NOS at the at the uh, input data points. Um, so that's like not not very interesting uh, in some sense. And and in addition to that, um, if uh, um, if we if we use a truncated power activation and we try to stack up the layers and make it a deeper neural network. And the function class it starts to represent becomes a little bit weird, right? So with L layer, uh, the, the order of the polynomials gets bigger and bigger as L, exponentially as L gets larger. Um, so the only um, activation function that enjoys the, the kind of stability of the function class is represent is, is ReLU, right? So, so that is also the reason why like, we don't want to like, maybe choose M to be larger than one in this activation function. Okay, so now let, let me delve into like our results on um, um, L layer uh, neural network with a slight change to the, uh, to, the, um, to, to the model architecture. So instead of considering um, the, the standard uh, deep ReLU activated neural network, uh, so we're gonna consider a parallel version of this. So, um, so, so the model lo looks like this. So I'm showing three, uh, but there are M, skinny, and small, um, but somewhat deep, um, um, standard, uh, uh, standard ReLU-active uh, feed-forward neural network that we, that, that we put, um, put my input uh, put my input through. Uh, and only in the end, after L layers, um, I take a linear combination of them. Okay, so this is what was what's known as a parallel neural network, and this neural network, like we didn't propose this, and there there were a lot of uh, existing work that studies the theoretical properties and and similar uh, structures of such neural networks uh, 
appeared in SqueezeNet and uh, ResNext and, and so on. So these are model architectures that people sometimes actually use in practice. Um, um, another thing is that you can also think about this neural network, a parallel neural network as a standard neural network, but with a hard-coded block diagonal uh, sparsity pattern uh, on, on, on every layer, right? So, so uh, every layer, if you group this W2 together, and this is a block diagonally sparse uh, uh, parameter weights, right? So, so you don't need to learn, uh, learn where the sparsity pattern is. You can just fix it to be uh, like something that, that, that which simplifies the training process. Okay, the reason why we need to work with a parallel neural network is technical, but it will, it will become clear like why this is, uh, um, why this is, this is choice. And interestingly, uh, what we can show is that there is a reparameterization using almost like the identical argument to the two layer case uh, in this parallel neural network. We can transform this into something else that's more easily, uh, more, more easily uh, analyzed. So what we can do is that uh, we, we can basically extract the scale of every layer and then uh, apply the um, that so-called one homogeneous property of the ReLU activation by pushing all the weights together to the very end and group them together into, into these weights. So now um, this W are replaced with W bar um, and, and each one of them uh, ends up having a bounded from a business norm. Um, but once, once we do this, by applying the same AMGM inequality, um, the, the uh, weight decay regularization becomes an LP, uh, LP, norm, um, LP norm constraint or LP norm regularization on the, uh, on the coefficients uh, that got applied to the individual subnetworks. Okay? So um, a, a better way of presenting this is, is by, 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 by this figure. So, uh, so what, what we are effectively doing is to show uh, that the parallel neural network on the weight decay is equivalent to um, a linear regression problem with, the, uh, with, with a learned uh, dictionary and a sparse uh, coefficient vector, right? So, so this, uh, every column of this learned dictionary is an evaluation um, of one particular subnetwork uh, on all the input data point x1 to xn. Um, and, and this coefficient vector uh, is this AJ, right? It, 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 it satisfies a constraint with a bounded LP norm where P is 2 over L, right? So notice that uh, whenever the network is larger than, has a depth larger than 2, um, then this is a sparse inducing regularization term that's even sparser than the standard L1 norm, right? So we are really uh, preferring a very sparse uh, um, like num number of uh, a very small number of subnetworks that's actually active, and we so so in some sense what what this parallel neural network is doing on the way decay is to 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 start with like many uh, random subnetworks and you optimize them at the same time, but iteratively a lot of uh, these individual uh, subnetworks got got weeded out, and what remains uh, is just a very small number of them. And then we're approximating the label using a, a, a sparse linear combination of, of this end-to-end -end learned um, network. Right? So it's really linear regression, but with a, with a um, learnable um, basis, basis function. Okay? So what, what this allows us to do, um, this equivalence allows us to analyze a statistical property and analyze the approximation theory and generalization theory for this. Uh, and then we can apply this to the non-parametric regression problem that, that motivated us. To, uh, so so to, to start, so let me like, give a bit of a formal setup. Um, so, um, so we consider um, the, the bond, so-called bounded variation class where the m's order derivative of function class, uh, function m, uh, has a total variation that's bounded. And also this f is uniformly bounded everywhere. So that's called a bounded variation class. Um, and, and we are also considering another function class called Bessel class family, parameterized by this alpha, p, and q. Um, yeah, all these are very complicated, but uh, uh, what, 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 what happens is that the bounded variation class is related to this well-studied Bessel family um, as it is sandwiched in between two Bessel classes with uh, q being either one or infinity, and p is always one. Right, and P being only one uh, is uh, is in, in some sense largest among 
all the best of classes with p larger than one. Um, and, and, and what's interesting is that the optimal rates for both uh, these functions, these best of classes, they are the same, which means that uh, we can study the properties of bounded variation class by studying the, the properties of methods uh, on its estimation error on, on the best of class directly, right? So this one will give an upper bound for this, and this one will give a lower bound for um, estimating functions in the, in, the, in the bounded variation class as well. And the metrics that we, are, where we consider uh, is a standard mean square error, uh, which is defined on, on the so-called empirical norm, right? And the empirical norm is um, evaluated only on the observed input data points, x1 to xn, right? So notice that this is different from, uh, uh, for, from the, the settings that Misha talked about, uh, in which it's a random design. So in our case, we consider the fixed design setting, whereas x1 to xn, they are, they are fixed ahead of time. Um, and, and the norm, the performance metric, is, is um, defined only by your predictions on these observed data points, right? So anything that's interpolating is going to have like a trivial uh, estimation error. Okay? Um, and the random design version of the, the result like is, is the same, um, but yeah, we don't, we don't uh, focus on that set of results in this talk. Okay? So, so here are uh, our results. So, so recall that uh, for the best of class and bounded variation class, so these are the optimal rates that any methods could achieve. Uh, like any methods will, uh, the, the optimal methods will achieve and no, no methods can do better than this in the minimax sense. But neural tangent kernels and all other linear smoothers can only achieve the suboptimal rates with, uh, with this minus one here and with this plus one rather than plus two, plus two here. So how does neural network do? Um, so, so it turns out that under some mild restriction on this best of class, um, the mean square error of the arc mean of this parallel neural network with the optimally chosen hyperparameter lambda um, for, 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 for each, each example separately uh, is achieving uh, the minimax rate uh, as this L, as a depth, uh, goes to infinity, right? So, so, so as this L gets larger, um, this term come fr comes from the approximation, so we need these steps to be somewhat large to use, um, to be logarithmically large um, to, to use the piecewise linear functions to approximate arbitrarily smooth function. So, so th th this term like, should be there, so there's no way that you can get rid of this. Um, and, and this term, uh, as L gets larger, and this 2 over L goes to zero, and, and the remaining rate becomes the optimal rates for estimating functions in this uh, function class with heterogeneous smoothness. Okay, so it applies to both the Bessel family and the bounded variation classes through to the, to the um, sandwich formula that I gave just, just now, right? So, so it suffices to take this L to be like not crazily large, but logarithmically large as a function of, uh, uh, as a function of the, the, the data size. So um, there are a few take-home messages that we can we can state about this this result. So so first of all, this this uh, this result performs a new formal separation between what can be achieved by uh, kernels uh, versus what can be achieved by uh, like a deep neural network. So um, simply follows from our upper bounds with a sufficiently large L uh, versus uh, the linear smoother lower bound from the Donald uh, Leo McGibbon, um, and and the it's, secondly, uh, it shows that deep neural network achieves smaller error comparing to shallow uh, neural networks with, with ReLU activation. So um, that's, that says that depth actually matters uh, for, for neural networks to behave, uh, behave well uh, in, in these simple tasks. Um, and, and in addition to this, um, we require a degree of over-parameterization, but, but not significant over-parameterization. So, so actually, it doesn't really matter. So whenever uh, the, the, the parameter is larger, whenever the number of subnetworks is larger than, say, the number of data points, so it doesn't have to go way beyond that. But the, but the mechanism for the, our approach to achieve the optimal rate and to achieve the generalized, uh, optimal generalization error is not the same mechanism uh, um, as, as a neural tangent kernel. Uh, instead, it's really coming from explicit regularization. It's really coming from the, the, the resulting uh, sparsity that, that gives rise to um, the, 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 the good behaviors. Okay, so, um, 
So, so let's, let's also take a look at the de more detailed comparison of neural networks uh, with the classical methods. So um, on the left, um, I'm, I'm showing the general form of this output function. So all of these methods can be written as a, um, as a linear combination of a certain um, basis function um, and with a coefficient ci. What's different is, uh, is how these CI are fitted and, and how these basis functions are chosen. So in, in most classical statistical methods, so, so these GIs are, are hard-coded. So for instance, for, for locally adaptive regression splines and trend filtering, these are chosen to be the truncated power basis. Um, and, and then the coefficient uh, vector is estimated with an L1 penalty. For wavelets, uh, these GIs are hard-coded to be the chosen uh, choice of the wavelet, wavelet, uh, uh, wavelet basis. It can be the standard hard basis uh, and, and CDGV and, and, and any other fancier wavelets that you use. And, and all of them are achieving the minimax rate up to a logarithmic factor. And you can either use L1 or L0 sparsity depending on whether you use soft thresholding or hard thresholding for the wavelet denoising. Um, what's different is that in the parallel neural network, uh, these GIs are also learned from data, right? So, so they are parametric, and each one of them is a, a ReLU-activated neural network with a, with a logarithmic depth and logarithmic width, okay? So they are kind of a simple basis function that can be learned from data, uh, and the coefficient vectors, when we do the standard weight decay, um, it, it is uh, inducing the LP sparsity with P being 2 over L, okay? So one may like wonder, right? Um, now that we are we are like learning the basis function, we're doing representation learning. There must be a price to pay, right? But what our results suggest is that the the, the price that we pay uh, is actually very mild, uh, if anything at all. Like if our uh, bound is uh, uh, upper bound is loose, then then you don't necessarily need to pay anything for for getting the benefit of l representation learning. Right, so this is something that's, that's pretty interesting, um, that, that, that we are paying almost no statistical prices for getting the generality of a representation learning. And, and especially given that we can like, also use these uh, 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 sub-networks, which, which is a, a ReLU-activated deep neural network with a, like a small, small number of weights, to uh, approximate more complicated functions that's tailored to different structures in the um, uh, um, in, in, in the data, uh, besides uh, these that can be already hard-coded from the truncated power basis or, or, or the wavelets, then, then the benefit that we're getting is, could be more significant beyond this, this family of problems. Okay, so, all right, still have some time. So let's look at some examples. Um, so, so on the left, I'm showing this uh, um, Doppler-like example that I, I, I showed earlier. So, so this is a um, set, set of methods. Uh, this, so on, on the left, I've seen that changes very quickly. So this is a high-frequency region. On the right, I have a more slowly moving region. I'm, I'm fitting uh, this underlying function using these black dots, which are the noisy observations uh, with, with several different methods. So smoothing spline is a linear smoother that's used as a baseline, and trend filtering in blue uh, is a is a like state of the art in locally adaptive non-parametric regression, and and then I'm fitting a parallel neural network with just a gradient based optimizer, right? Uh, and, um, and and we tune the hyperparameter, we tune the weight decay hyperparameter, which gives us uh, the, the the different fits, and and in the middle um, I'm plotting the resulting mean square error comparing to the ground truth um, um, over uh, versus the so-called effective degree of freedom, right? So this is like not measuring the number of parameters, but actually measuring the number of effective number of parameters. That's the right characterization for the generalization bound. So what we can see is that uh, uh, with appropriately chosen hyperparameter, so, so basically by, by adjusting the different hyperparameter on these methods, we can trace out this curve, but this degree of freedom allows us to compare them with an with equal footing, with, uh, with, uh, fairly at, uh, say, degree of freedom 50. This is how neural network did, and this is how trend filtering did, and this is like how smoothing spline achieves. It's not surprising that the smoothing spline is not doing too well, at especially low degree of freedom, but, but it looks like the neural network is performing the best among uh, all, all of the methods. 
And, and what's even more interesting is this uh, figure on the, on the right-hand side. So what we can see uh, is that these are all of the, the sub-networks, all of the sub-networks that are active. So, so if we count the number of colors, it's like five or six uh, uh, sub-networks. So, so these are the only basis functions that ends up um, present at the end of the optimization process. So, so, so really doing weight decay is, is indeed making, um, um, making the learn function very sparse. Okay, and, and that should remind you of, uh, say, lottery ticket hypothesis, because in practice, when, when this is the output of your learn uh, network, like in, in the deployment time, right, it saves computation very significantly. Uh, it, it naturally adapts to um, the, the underlying complexity of the function of interest. Another interesting aspect of this uh, example is that you can see that some of these basis functions are uh, specifically tailored for, uh, for the high frequency region. And, and others are for the lower frequency regions. And, and by like, learning a sparse number of basis functions, it somehow directly captures the heterogeneous smoothness directly. And that also makes the output of the learned result very interpretable. Okay, so how about we, we make this uh, even, uh, even more, more adaptive? So, so let's consider this, this hybrid setting when so when the left-hand side is a piecewise linear function and the right-hand side, so these are piecewise cubic functions, right? So, the, so this is a hybrid of two non-parametric family uh, that, that there's like, suppose you, you try to use a two-layer neural network for doing it or for, to use a train filtering uh, for, for estimating this function, you can't because the regularization term uh, requires you to specify the number of times the function is differentiable, right? To specify the function class. But, but neural network, uh, since we're not specifying that directly, but rather we're learning the basis functions, we can, we can sort of uh, learn uh, the right basis function to simultaneously capture the piecewise linear region and the piecewise quadratic region with different basis function directly. And we can see that this is reflected in the um, MSE plot and in the, in the, in the actually learned, um, learned basis function. Okay, so I hope this convinces you that the sparsity uh, in this example is really the fundamental uh, quantity that captures uh, the behavior of neural network in, in curve fitting. Okay, so um, I'm going to like very quickly uh, talk about a few interesting technical aspects of our results. Uh, um, so, so, yeah, if, if you, you, are, you are not interested in this, it's perfectly fine. So, so just wait for the summary at the very end. Um, so, so, so there are three steps that we use to analyze uh, the mean square error uh, of neural networks. The first is the decomposition of uh, the mean square error into approximation error and, and the generalization error. Okay, so, so uh, since we're dealing with a square loss, uh, we use a kind of a standard self-bounding argument for achieving this kind of 1 over n rate rather than the 1 over square root of n rate uh, with, a, uh, with, with a few small differences. Um, so, so over here, uh, so this is a standard metric entropy, but where we are counting the metric entropy only for a particular projection of the function space, right? There is also, also an un, uh, unregularized version of uh, unregularized uh, part of the function space that we cannot really capture with this metric entropy. So, so that comes out uh, separately. So we got this d over n term where this d is a constant, but for the remainder, we are using the, the metric entropy of the, of the function class to be uh, uh, to, to be used. And this is parameterized by the weight decay parameter and, and also by uh, the, the, the number of parameters in the individual separate networks. Okay, so, so it might be surprising for you to see this one over n term, but, but this fractional factor from the non-parametric rate is going to be reflected later through the calculation of this metric entropy. Okay, the second part of this is to get an approximation bound. So this is for us to uh, to bound the approximation error part of uh, the, the, the previous uh, uh, proposition. Um, so, so the idea is that we can use neural network, we can use a relatively small neural network with logarithmic width and logarithmic depths to approximate arbitrarily smooth functions uh, um, um, that, that are simple. So in particular, we can use neural networks to approximate uh, the cardinal B-spline basis of, of all the others from uh, one, uh, one, two, three, and all the way to any arbitrary constant order uh, level of smoothness. So, so these little bumps are then um, shifted and scaled so that we can, we can use this to 
um, to, to recover the whole set of cardinal beat spline bases. And, 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 and then we, we and knowing that the cardinal beat spline bases can be, uh, can be used to, to approximate any best of space functions, so this allows us to, 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 to obtain the approximation theoretic results for um, like getting, um, sh sh to show that this function class is nearly realizable for, 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 for us to obtain the estimate for this underlying function F0. Okay, um, and, and, and interestingly, um, so this is an illustration of how neural network, as we get deeper, it approximates smoother functions better. So, so again, these are ReLU activated neural networks. It can only represent the piecewise linear functions, but as we get deeper, right? So this is just a one layer, um, and this is just two layers, so you cannot do any, anything better uh, than, than just this function. But as we get deeper with only two parameters within every layer, um, right, we can see that the residual gets smaller exponentially as the depth gets bigger. Right? Once we get to, say, the fourth layer, we can no longer distinguish between what neural network can represent and this quadratic function uh, that we can use. Right? And just by making it a little bit uh, even, even deeper, then we can use this to capture like, uh, the truncated power basis and then use it to, re re to recover the, 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 the cardinal beat spline basis. So that's the underlying idea for the approximation theory. So, so the last piece of this is to the calculation of the metric entropy. So, so here's this uh, uh, lemma, lemma six is an extension lemma that, that says that uh, if this GI is coming from um, this function, function class G, and this G has a metric entropy that we can already calculate, and, and then the coefficient vector satisfies an LP norm bound with this parameter P, then, then the, any, any linear combination, sparse, LP sparse linear combination uh, is a function class that has a metric entropy that can be described by this, right? So this is, uh, uh, and, and, and this, uh, the metric entropy of, uh, of this, this G goes into, goes into here, um, but, but then, then there are also other parameters that, that, that depend on uh, the, the radius of this LP norm. Um, LP norm bound. So by consolidating everything together and, and substituting this bound into the proposition initially, uh, then we end up getting the right rate, uh, which, which proves the results. Okay, so, uh, I'm, so let, me, let, me, let me wrap up. Um, so in summary, um, so I've talked about the story of uh, how neural network works for curve fitting. Um, for, for fitting functions with uh, very mild uh, assumptions on the smoothness of the function, and the smoothness is heterogeneous uh, at a different region of the space. So, so the results indicates a formal separation from kernel methods. So NTK or any other RKHS methods is not able to achieve the optimal rate while uh, just a slightly deeper neural network with a parallel structure uh, and tuning only weight decay can achieve the optimal rate. Deeper neural networks are better than, um, than shallower neural network. And the approximation theory cannot be overcome, like unless you, you use a much smoother uh, activation functions. And in addition, um, we've, we've seen that neural network from both the theory and the experiment that enjoys a very strong sense of adaptivity. So we never really need to specify um, the alpha, p, and q parameters for the, for the, uh, for, for the, for the Bessel class, um, and it automatically finds a rate that, uh, um, that, that minimizes the mean square error, like corresponding to the smallest family that contains the underlying ground truth function, right? So that's a very strong sense of adaptivity that, that, that's, that's missing uh, even in, in, in classical statistical methods. And, and what really um, gives us the, um, the strong adaptivity is a, is a learned representation, is a learned basis function, and the resulting implicit sparsity from weight decay. Right? Um, and lastly, there's interesting computational benefits that are coming from the sparsity that could remind us of the lottery ticket hypothesis. Um, so I've, like, we, we've, we've, we've done like only a, the bare minimum of this line of research. So, so this is a very simple model, focusing only on regression, and mostly the univariate case. So some part of the Bessel family also covers uh, the higher dimensional case, but it's a, still a very restrictive set of um, settings, it doesn't explain anything about the curse of dimensionality. Um, but uh, there are many extensions that can be um, 
branched out from this line of work. For instance, we can try to formalize a subregion local adaptivity through different function classes in different subregions. We can, we can um, like, the, the second one is a more challenging task. How do we understand the non-parallel uh, neural network with weight decay, right? So it's inducing some other kind of uh, implicit regularizations that's not really sparsity. Um, so, so we don't have much, much clues, but there's something called a path norm regularization that might be, might be useful here. But then how that is connected to local adaptivity is a bit unclear to us. Um, um, and we can think about uh, lower dimensional manifolds and we can think about how the multitask version of, of, of this problem uh, can be formally connected to say over uh, dictionary learning with over complete uh, basis functions. And another thing that uh, discussed with Misha briefly is uh, it's, it's absolutely unclear like how to handle the classification task. It seems like the regression and the classifications are qualitatively very different, uh, different beasts to, to deal with. But, but there, there are interesting ideas that we can, we can say, use this, the, the same technique to handle the generalized linear models, including say cross entropy losses, but maybe not the zero one loss uh, classification task. With that, I'll stop and hopefully I still have a few minutes to take questions. Yeah, thanks for uh, pretty, uh, one of the most fascinating talk I've really heard in recent years. Uh, and it really, you have put quite a few interesting pieces, right? The depth, the role of depth, the sparsity addiction learning, and also really the learn the functional basis. That's actually very, very important. Um, and I have a quick question about, uh, you have this parallel uh, network. And, but you have to train it, right, with the right. functions within those sample from those uh, classes. Yes. So typically how, how much that is, how over-parameterized the number of blocks you do need, uh, I don't think you get to the details. But can right. you say something about right. it? Yeah, good, good question. It suffices to choose a number of uh, networks to be n. Yeah, so, so um, like for different function classes, it can be slightly smaller than n, where you can still achieve the optimal rates. But uh, choosing it to be n or slightly larger than n will, will suffice. Are those networks are easy to train, or how deep, or um, typically? Yeah. So, so for the for the uh, practical examples, we 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 we, we tried different optimizers. Uh, we ended up needing to use a layer-wise training to to get it to work. So optimization is um, is a bit unclear, uh, to be honest. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, so it's still, still based on the gradient-based optimization, but what we were able to analyze is a statistical property uh, associated with the arc mean, right? So the dynamics of the optimization is a completely open problem here.